Wong. Holy crap. Hey guys, our video this week is on the new, properly Disney canon lightsaber, as opposed to the legendary lightsabers in their history that we covered in last week's video. As some may know, the expanded universe, part of Disney's acquisition, has had in the neighborhood of 40 years to develop history, context, and story. Disney, on the other hand, has had a mere six years to develop things. As such, to make up for what would otherwise be a shorter than normal video, we are also going to go over the surprisingly interesting history and evolution of the real-life lightsaber, the props used on set for the making of the various films. So we'll be going over how the lightsaber now differs from what we once knew in Legends Land, as well as how the tech evolved and changed for the on-stage lightsaber props throughout the films. Alright, so to begin with, the modern-day lightsaber in Disney canon is nearly identical in both form and function to the modern lightsabers from the previous canon we discussed in our Legendary Lightsabers video last week. Side note, if you haven't seen that video, here's a link. We'll be making references to it as this video goes on, so you'll be much better informed if you've seen last week's video. But moving on. There are two major changes to the history and function of the lightsaber. First, the history is both simpler and much more mysterious. So, in Legends, the lightsaber didn't come into existence till thousands of years after the first saber variant, the Force Saber, and it went through a number of iterations before reaching the point at which it could be called a true lightsaber. But we have the history of that family of weaponry all the way back to before even the Force Saber itself existed. In contrast, in Disney canon, the lightsaber is so old the design is so ingrained into the world of Star Wars that it is unknown where the design came from or how old it is. Presumably, like the legendary canon, the lightsaber itself has gone through a series of upgrades over time, with more recent lightsabers being more powerful and functional than older models, but with all its iterations still being simply lightsabers, as opposed to older legendary variants like the protosaber or force saber, which have no indication of ever existing. Instead, the lightsaber itself is simply ancient. As far as anyone knows, the lightsaber has always been there, an immutable constant in the history of the galaxy. An elegant weapon for a more civilized age. The second major change to lightsabers actually has to do with a change to one of the lightsaber's most important and iconic components. If you know anything about the lightsabers of Star Wars fame, you probably know that they are in part powered by saber crystals. Most commonly in legendary canon, they were powered by kyber crystals, but could be powered by a wide variety of other crystals and materials. In Legends, the kyber crystals and other crystals like them were crystals infused with a higher than normal level of force energy. They could grow naturally or be cultivated synthetically and came in a wide variety of colors. Some even possessed enhanced traits that could be passed on to the lightsaber into which it was incorporated. In Disney canon, kyber crystals are still used as saber crystals. However, to the best of our research, no other type of crystals exist. Additionally, where once they grew in a variety of colors, kyber crystals are now naturally colorless and clear. In order to grant a lightsaber a color, such as the blue and green that most Jedi are seen carrying within the films and Disney's expanded universe, a light side force wielder must meditate upon a crystal for a time, sometimes days at a time, and when this process is completed, the kyber crystal takes on a color, based, at least in part, upon the force wielder who bonded with the crystal. This color is generally permanent, meaning that the lightsaber they wield won't change color even if, for example, a Jedi were to forge a bond with a crystal, craft a saber, and then later in life fall to the dark side. <coughs> <coughs> In order for a Jedi turned Sith to have a red saber, they would have to craft a new red crystal saber. Most commonly, as we've seen, the crystal color for a light side force wielder will be blue or green. Our research has not turned up anything more concrete than theories concerning how yellow or purple saber crystals, such as those seen wielded by Jedi Temple Guardians and Mace Windu respectively, are created. So we'll leave those colors alone for now. However, red and white crystals we do know about. So attentive or clever viewers will have noticed that earlier when talking about meditating on crystals, we specifically said that light side force wielders perform the meditation to grant a crystal its color. That is because, in Disney canon, kyber crystals are inherently attuned to the light side of the force. A dark side adherent, such as a Sith, cannot actually commune with a kyber crystal the same way a light side adherent, such as a Jedi, can. Instead, they have to go through a different process. Back in the legendary continuity, the standard red-bladed Sith lightsaber was a result of the Sith creating synthetic crystals to power their lightsabers. They did this for several reasons. Foremost among them, originally, was that the Jedi Order actually had a chokehold monopoly on the worlds throughout the galaxy most likely to grow kyber crystals, making acquisition of such crystals difficult for their longtime enemies, the Sith. So, to get over this problem, the Sith turned to crafting man-made crystals of their own with the process most often resulting in a red crystal. Though like all synthetic crystals, processes did exist to alter the color. 
As time went on, the belief also came to be that the Sith crystal crafting process developed crystals of superior quality. In some cases, even able to break or disrupt the blades of other lightsabers that utilized natural crystals. In Disney canon, this is no longer the case. The process for creating a red crystal has, like with the blue and green crystals, become much more mystical. The Sith ritual for creating a red saber crystal now consists of having the Sith that desires to forge a new saber hunt down a Jedi, slay that Jedi, and take their crystal to use in their own new lightsaber through a process that has come to be known as bleeding. The bleeding process involves taking a Jedi's crystal, imbued with light side essence, and forcing all of the Sith's pain, anger, fear, sadness, hatred, you know, all those things that a Sith lives on and feeds on, into the crystal until it bleeds, turning it to the color red of a classic Sith lightsaber blade. The crystals are at least quasi-sentient and, as previously mentioned, naturally attuned to the light side of the Force. As such, they fight the bleeding process, meaning that a prospective Sith Saber creator must have a strong will in order to conquer their stolen crystal and bleed it. Some crystals will even go as far as to show a Sith visions of a better, non-evil future if they don't continue to crush the kyber crystal with hatred. It's not known whether visions like this are common, but at the very least it happened in Vader's case, with his taken crystal giving him a vision of a life that could have been if he'd chosen not to bleed the kyber for his new blade, but instead gone to face down the Emperor and live out life as Anakin rather than Darth Vader. Obviously, we know he didn't do this, he bled the crystal, and led a life of evil. But it is also unknown whether the bleeding process requires a previously attuned lightsaber crystal, or whether you can bleed an unattuned clear kyber. It is entirely possible that bleeding a Jedi's kyber crystal is simply a tradition that the Sith created since they had a readily available enemy. Which leads us to white crystals. Like red kyber crystals, our research indicates that white crystals do not occur naturally, in that they are not formed by Jedi meditating upon a crystal. Instead, a white kyber crystal is essentially the opposite of a red kyber crystal. A white crystal is formed when a Jedi or other light side force wielder takes a red blood crystal, presumably from a fallen Sith or dark side wielder, and reverses the process. Purifying the once damaged crystal by presumably pouring all the Jedi's hope, peace, serenity, harmony, and knowledge into the kyber and reversing the bleeding process. We see this happen in the Ahsoka novel, which is how she acquires the twin lightsaber blades seen in the Star Wars Rebels series. We know there are a lot of maybes, perhapses, and conjecture regarding the new reality of kyber crystals. For example, we found a lot of people saying that synthetic crystals no longer exist. But as far as we can see, they just haven't been mentioned anywhere. But that doesn't preclude their existence. Any more than one example of the Sith's bleeding ceremony confirms that a kyber can only be bled if it already had a connection to a Jedi. The Disney canon is new enough that there is, frankly, quite a bit we really just don't know, and the indications so far seem to be that they're trying to lean heavily toward the mystical and mysterious. So it may be quite a while before these sorts of things are fully fleshed out, assuming we ever get solid answers as to how these things work at all. Some things we do have solid information on, though, really cool solid information in fact, are how the actual physical props of the Star Wars movies worked and evolved over the course of the series. We came across this information while doing research for this and the previous lightsaber video, and we thought the information was cool enough to share. We're going to go over the props by movie, in order of release, since that's how they evolved. So first came Star Wars Episode IV. These early saber props were really ingenious, and if you know anything about the prop design from the first film, you know that the vast majority of the materials on the screen were cobbled together by using a hodgepodge of crazy materials to create something new and wonderful. The lightsabers were no different. As the film series would go on, the lightsaber hilts would go through many different upgrades. With the earliest hilts from the episode 4 being cobbled together from camera and World War grenade parts, and the hilts from the more recent films like episode 3 being made from amazing things like chrome-plated rubber. Yes, that's a thing, and it's a trip to watch something definitely metallic, twist, and bend like that. But we're going to focus on the lightsaber blades, or what the props used for lightsaber blades. So back in episode 4, the production team was actually very ambitious in that they attempted to create a blade that glowed in real life on set, and letting that be what you see on the film. They attached a three-sided rod to the saber hilt that was covered in retro-reflective material, the same kinds of stuff that we put on road signs so that speed limits are reflected and can be read at night. According to Mark Hamill, who played Luke Skywalker, that stuff was essentially movie screen material at the time, and as the term silver screen originally stemmed from the use of reflective metals in the actual movie screen material, we have every reason to believe the truth of that statement. 
With the three-sided rod in place on the prop, a motor inside of the hilt, connected to a battery pack on the hip via a wire run through the inside of the actor's clothing, caused the reflective blade to spin, creating an actual glowing effect on the stage. Does that sound like a real-life protosaber to anyone else? The idea that maybe this prop design influenced the creation of the in-universe protosaber years later is absolutely fantastic to us. There were two major problems with this faux glow spinning saber prop though. First, the rod would only glow when in a properly lit section of the set, so if the lighting wasn't handled properly, the actor stepped out of the lighting area or the saber rod was pointed directly at the camera, the effect was lost or diminished. This is why in scenes such as the fight between Obi-Wan and Vader, the glow of the blade, which we'll get to momentarily, seems to shrink down to a much smaller point when the lightsaber is pointed directly at the camera. The second major problem was that the rods were incredibly fragile. They would break repeatedly on set, especially during a fight scene, and were constantly in need of being replaced. They didn't really have a solution for the breaking problem beyond taking extra care and a wonderful work ethic by the crew, but they did come up with a solution for the glowing blade problem, albeit a solution that sounds like the worst punishment imaginable. Once the filming of the lightsaber scenes was completed, the film was then rotoscoped, which is a process of taking the film and then hand drawing something into it frame by frame. In this case, the glowing saber blades we're all familiar with were created through rotoscoping to look fuller, with more volume than they did in real life. And this is also when the colors were first introduced. As the retro reflective material and all of the early concept art for the lightsabers had all been blades simply being a white color. When all the effort of rotoscoping was incorporated, they decided to add a dash of color to the scene, and thus were born the classic red and blue lightsabers. The guy in charge of rotoscoping the lightsaber scenes also suggested adding in a frame of light colored film to help make the blades look more staticky and less solid since they were supposed to be made of energy, giving the final touch to that iconic weapon when it first appeared on screen. Real quick, in case it wasn't clear, this guy had to go through the film footage, frame by frame, and draw, with pen and ink, by hand, the blue and red glowing effects that we see on the film. As editors ourselves who have had to keyframe things, this is just, just one of the worst hells we can imagine. Come episode 5, the directors decided that an on-stage glowing effect wasn't really worth the effort anymore, and that it would be both simpler and better to use static carbon rods for the blades, since they were going to have to add the proper glowing effects in post-production anyway. As the blades weren't spinning, and there was neither a running motor nor cores attached to other places, these props were significantly less cumbersome and bulky. However, they still suffered from fragility issues, breaking often, though the cast were tremendously disciplined, finishing scene movements with broken props in the hopes that the shot could be saved. The technology didn't really improve by the time Episode 6 came out, and they continued to use the fragile carbon rod. However, it should be noted that while there were fantastically detailed in-universe reasons for many of the creative decisions in the Star Wars films, including things like the pacing of the fight scenes throughout the film series, the decision to make Luke's new saber in Episode 6 green was actually for the simple reason that in the shots on Tatooine, where the green energy blade makes its first appearance, the blue color of the lightsaber, which was the original concept color, as shown with early promotional materials, was washed out and faded, hardly standing out at all from the bright blue sky of the desert shots. So they decided that the blade would be green, since that stood out more against the blue and still worked everywhere else. By the time Episode 1 was being filmed, the technology had upgraded somewhat. Static rods were still being used, but now, made of steel and aluminum, painted generally to match the color of the lightsaber that the actor was supposed to be wielding. Presumably to both help the actors visualize things, as well as make post-production work easier. These rods didn't snap and break as the previous carbon rods did, however they would bend or flex under stress, so frequent replacements were still required. For the filming of all three of the prequel films, the lightsaber glow was still rotoscoped into the film, but the process was accomplished digitally instead of using hand and ink as in the originals. These same types of rods would also be used for episode 2, but by the time episode 3 was being filmed, the prop weapons got another upgrade. For the filming of episode 3, the saber rods were static carbon fiber rods. They had been laminated in both glass and plastic, making them significantly more durable than all of their predecessors. They were extremely difficult to break, which was a very good thing considering the speed the lightsabers were being whipped around in that film. The trade-off for a more durable weapon, however, was that it functioned a little bit more like an actual weapon, and the actors in Episode 3 earned a number of bruises and even a few scars during the filming of the various lightsaber fights. 
By the time that episodes 7 and 8 were filmed, fan markets for the lightsabers had been in full swing for decades, and the filmmakers actually used props of similar design quality to what can be purchased from high-end replica shops by the average person for many of their shots. While more durable lightsaber props were used for more physically intense combat scenes, actual full-on glowing sabers were used for other shots, which allowed for everything from greater immersion for the actors to letting reality and physics cause most of the lighting effects you see in shots like this. And those are basically the stories of the lightsaber, both in-universe modern canon and the real-life story of the lightsaber blades. We hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave us a like. And if you have any ideas for videos you want to see us do in the future, be they lore or let's play, let us know in the comments down below. And don't be shy. Feel free to say hello while you're down there. Lastly, if you'd like to see more videos from us in the future, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And in the meantime, guys, this has been Two, Two Men and a, and a Mic, Mike, signing Mike. off. Hey guys, you can click the link in the left for our last lore video. You can click the link on the right for our last let's play. And right here in the middle, that orb, you can hit that to, to subscribe. subscribe. Also, ring the bell if you want to be notified when we post a new video. This, this is Two Men and a Mic. Thanks, Thanks for watching. watching.